Hello, and welcome to our time. Welcome, and... Nice to have you with us. <laughs> it's always nice to have you with us. Janice, have you noticed the politicians, whenever anything occurs and any announcement is ever made, nobody ever gives us clean speech, I'd call it. Really? Well, everyone what do you mean by that Well, exactly? everybody criticises everybody else. Like, your idea is no good, my idea is the only one that is, and then the other one talks and says, no, their idea is rubbish, it's our idea that's the only thing that's... You'd think... What are you getting to? Well, I'm getting, the, I'm getting to the <laughs> exactly. point that it's very clear throughout the country people are becoming disenchanted mm -hmm. with politicians. And one of the real reasons, it seems to me, and just talking to people, you know, in the streets, so to speak, is that they're becoming disillusioned simply because everybody criticises everybody else. And what's happened is the idea of working together has really dissipated from our society, except in certain areas. Right. And Which would be? Well, which would be really what we're talking to our first guest in this episode about. But just before we start that interesting conversation, it would be really advantageous to all of us to stop criticising each other and start learning to work together on everything in life, oh. because by doing that you can achieve so much more. And really, it would be helpful if our politicians would start doing that too. But people like our very first guest, Rhys Roberts from the Lions Club Bargain Centre here in South Australia at Blackwood, you've certainly worked together, haven't you? Well, I think it's very simple. Uh, the word is tolerance, because if you wish to achieve things that are more than uh, what you can do alone, you've got to do it in a group. And if you want to do it in a group, You've got to accept that your own idea as such is not necessarily going to be the one that's accepted. Mm. There's give and take. Mm. Tolerance, you take the strength of each individual and you accept the uh, weaknesses uh, as you would those of a friend. But all work together to a common goal. Absolutely. And, and that's is that the only... what Lions Clubs are really all about? It is. Lions and Rotary are the two biggest uh, operations in the world. They've each got about a million and a half people. And they've each been going uh, over 100 years, and that's one of the reasons I'm here with you the, today, because yes. uh, it's the 100th anniversary oh. of uh, Lions of Foundation Lions. in Chicago start? in 2017. He knew what I was going to say. Yes, Look, he, he was he on was there. On. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Now, because there are the, the two that are probably the most famous, the Rotarians and the Lions, what's the difference between the service clubs? Is that the right word for them, service clubs? It is. Service to the community? Is that what the service right, means? It, it is. It's simply realising, particularly in this country, how fortunate we are to A, be in this country and uh, just realising that the privilege of that, even the poorest of us are so much better off than other people around the world. Not it, just millions, but billions of them. And yes, it's serving other people. But Janice, you've travelled a lot, as have I, around the world. And I'm no doubt you've travelled quite a bit in your lifetime too. A little. We've seen countries in the world that aren't as well set up as we are, mm. that don't have the food or the resources mm. that we do. And yet we still seem to want to complain about everything. But I'm, um, I'm admiring people like yourself because... Uh, we're here to talk about specifically the bargain centre at Blackwood, but it's how the bargain centre came into being. It's fascinating. Well, it is fascinating. We've just mentioned a centenary. Well, it's also the 50th year this year since the Tasmanian bushfires of 1967. And uh, the appeal went out when 43 people were killed, hundreds injured, losses enormous, a national appeal went out, mm. and Australians, being the people that we are, we vastly oversubscribed it, <laughs> including here in Adelaide and particularly here in Blackwood. We have so many goods left over, the oversubscription. What are we going to do with them? <laughs> so well, at that thought, stage, your Lions there... Club was only a couple of years old. Yeah. And so we... Uh, thanks very much to the ladies in our club. Mm. They're the ones who said, well, we're not going to waste this lot. Okay. And let's sell it locally. And so it took off. And uh, on some days, the takings were really good. Uh, I've got a record that shows the takings on one day were $4. <laughs> really? And the real credit is not to us guys and girls who do it now. Our real credit is to those people who, having got $4 for the day, mm. decided, we're going to go with this. We're going to keep it going. So yeah. that means that today we pull in 
between two and three thousand on a Saturday morning. Gosh. Um, which is, uh, we're also famous for our sausage sizzles, but is you don't right? rate, rate money like that from three hours worth. So all of the goods, no, 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 but all of the goods are generally, generously donated, is that how you get Absolutely, yep. and of course these days after 50 years of it, it's uh, word of mouth. Right. And, and uh, yeah, people sorry, just ring us, yep. we go and pick it up. Anything? Or they can... All, also, what do you, anything is there anything you don't take? I've yes, got there this co-host and sometimes would be good to... Yeah. Yeah, well, we're, we're, well, we're getting on to the personal things like <laughs> food, which yes. is woman's responsibility. Oh, God, oh, did yes, I say you'll that? you'll be in trouble for that. And uh, Your clothing. Your clothes clothing. And, uh, and anything that goes close to... Anything that goes to the skin or anything that's perishable, we don't deal with. Oh, OK. Right. Clothing, you don't deal with clothing? No. OK. We get lots of clothing and that goes straight round to the Blackwood Roundabout where the Save the Children operation oh, is right. and the, so and the so ladies round there go round there. Right, so nothing, <laughs> yes, yeah, nothing's wasted. Well, we try not to waste too much. No, of course. But you need to remember that we are operating off a site that used to be the Eden Hills dump. Oh, oh really? And some people still regard us as the Eden Hills <laughs> dump. Oh, really? So we still spend Have a lot of money. Our second biggest cost is taking things to the dump. Oh, yes. Which is sad. Uh, but because people use the place as a dump. Yeah, and uh, we've, found it, to take it to the we've found it difficult to say no to people, mm. um, but we do have to now. The truth is, though, Reese, everybody who owns anything thinks that their whatever it is they have Treasures. is a treasure, yes. It's something that's valuable to them in mm. some way. Mm. Even if it is a daggy old singlet with a hole in it, it's special to the... To the person well, Malcolm, who at some the stage hole. in the future, you might feel that uh, you've fallen out of love with your tie, which is never. Well, you, you may change the Where tie. Where do you think not, I bought you... it from in the first place? You were at the bargain centre. Not yours, but another one. Yes. Right. I saw all these fabulous old ties. I love them. <laughs> well. Uh, whether it's your tie or whether it's the purple lounge suite that you bought in the 1970s when it was brand new and it really jazzed up. Has he really been to your house? The lounge room. <laughs> <laughs> then, the then it may still be perfectly My gypsy good. My caravan, yeah. But we'll take it. Because yes. what okay. may be somebody else's poison is somebody else's present. Treasure. Not treasure, yeah. Mm. So, uh, you know, we have. I guess we have a bit of a, a, a feeling that... These service clubs are um, predominantly for old people, are they? It's certain that people are older. The average age of lions in Australia is 67. Well, thank God we've got the medical facilities we've got now, because I reckon if you get somebody into, into the organisation at age 50, then you're going to get 20 years of work out of them mm. before they start to really slow down these days, because 70... And I can relate to that. Indeed, uh, I may not be the only one here who could almost relate to it. Who could um, you be talking about? They're all so young. <laughs> oh, I feel it must be our floor yeah, manager. That, that'd yes. be right. That'd be right. <laughs> um, but uh, it, no, we do have uh, Leo's clubs for yes, uh, people starting down around at the age of 18 oh, up to 25. Right. Okay. We have them in two groups. How long has that been going? Has that been going oh, for a while? Oh, that's been going for about uh, 50 years. Oh, OK. Mm. So it's been around a long while. Yeah. And uh, they, they work very well and uh, they, they're, they're a bit looser and a bit more... Uh, when I say looser, the rules you apply to a person who joined a club nearly 100 years ago or 50 years ago, our society has changed. Mm. You don't go different. out for a meeting, for a dinner meeting once a week. These days, you have a barbecue on a weekend, yeah. or you, uh, we, we, we relax. Um, uh, th th 30 years ago, he would have been underdressed to go to the movies, and so I certainly probably wouldn't have got let in. <laughs> that's um, true, isn't it? You know, I hadn't thought uh, of it in those terms, so that's very true. And uh, you, well, fancy a woman wearing slacks, pants, mm. uh, a, a, a skirt, and we would have had hats on, probably. Yes. Yeah. So I have we, we, we have to move with the times. Yes. Yeah. Um, so what is it, do you think, that attracts people to give their time so freely to these organisations? I think enough people grow up in this country. I can't speak strongly for other countries, but this is my home. Australia, uh, Australia's it. And we are just so damn fortunate. We, the last time we had the fabric of our society in this country threatened was in the Second World War. 
that's beyond the vast majority of Australians' knowledge. Mm, that's absolutely personal true. Personal knowledge. Yep. Uh, we live in a society where what's the worst thing that can happen to us at the moment? The electricity might go out in this state. Yes, that's true. Well, you know, yeah. that, that, that's really life-threatening, isn't yes. it? Well, for some people yeah, in some areas it's, it it's is. It's become that because exactly. life has changed so much. But, uh, Rhys, the interesting thing is, and probably your advice to anybody who's just sitting thinking, oh, I've retired, I don't know what to do with myself, is get out and find somebody, like a service club, and there are plenty around, check it out on the websites that are available if you're computer literate. Um, we'll leave a little bit of information on Facebook for you as well. Join one of these clubs because it's a great way to meet people and continue your life actively and purposefully. Welcome back. What a delight. What a delight is our next guest. Yes. Do you want to do the honours? Well, I'd just like to welcome Tom Vandeleur to the program. It's so lovely to have you here because you have so much... What, what's the word? Life experience. Experience. Do you well, like that? That sounds good to me. <laughs> welcome, Tom. <laughs> Thank you. It's Tom, to it's you. hard to know what to call you. Tom Vandeleur. Oh, Tom Vandeleur, <laughs> entertainer. <laughs> Come idiot, if you like. <laughs> but a man people. who started as, in, in life as a farmer. Started out in Kapunda as a farmer. We had quite a bit of country there. And uh, I suppose the whips come into that fact. That's where it started in the shearing sheds. I had a very good friend who used to shear for us, Les Cowan. He was an ex-rough rider. And he used to have come out and he'd be talking about all the Kidman days and so forth. I started off from there with the whips. That's where they virtually started. But and how then, did that turn into a performance career? Well, it was many, many years later. I mean, I was only about 12 or 13 at the time when that happened. And you were working then? Yeah, just on the family farm, yep. yes. And uh, from then, uh, I went into uh, went to college and I came back and I stayed on the farm. And then Dad bought me my first farm, Kath and I. Bought us our first farm. That's your wife? Yes. And, so you'd uh, married by this time, I assume. Yes. And uh, I don't know, from there, it just sort of started. We sold out and bought the old farm back again because my dad and uncle sold it. And then I bought it back. And then another guy come along 18 months later and said, Tom, do you want to sell the farm? I've got a buyer for you. I said, God, I've only had it 18 months. <laughs> so what do I want to sell it for? <laughs> but the money was too good. The offer was too good. So I sold that. And uh, then uh, it started off the entertainment from there. So how did the entertainment start? Was it, did it start with whips? Whip it cracking? started with whips. So yeah. cracking a whip and using that little last flick to make the little tail snap or whatever you call it. Yeah, speed of sound. Who taught you that? It goes with the, it goes with the accuracy and the timing. Right. Of that whip. And did you... Oh, each, each whip is obviously different. You've got a feel... You've got a feel for that whip. I mean, you can crack any whip, but to get the real feel of it... Yeah. ..to get it to go off all the time in various directions. Now, people might think, you know, whip cracking is not that brilliant a uh, performance thing, but I've actually seen you and your family perform many times in the past, and it's extraordinary oh, what they do. But it's yeah. not just that that they do, and we'll talk about that. But um, so you're a young married couple... You don't have a farm anymore, but you can crack a whip. We can crack a whip, but I think I've, I've jumped a segment there because we started off with the entertainment with roller skating. Oh. Yes, um, of course yes. you did. Yes. Well, we started this off and uh, that became a big, a big thing with us was the roller skating. My wife told me it wouldn't happen. So that was the worst thing she could so, have ever told So me. did you skate or you just provided no, skates I, for skaters? I couldn't skate. We provided them. I could balance on them and that's as far. Same as but me. But all the other girls could. And, of course, Michael, who was the son at the time, he he could... Oh, he fascinated everyone, a bit like Mater's doing now. Yeah, OK. And so Mater is your grandson... That's right. ..who is also showing signs and very strong signs of being a, a showman as well. Well, a performer so, across right? the board, actually. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. getting back to the, the roller skating, we've got something like 15 centres uh, are right around from Casterton right through to Neil, Victoria, all over the place, Narracourt, Mount Gambier. Yeah. We had the whole thing sewn up. 
And then, of course, the introduction came of the, uh, of the violence and you had to have security guards, right. you had to have the whole lot, so we bowed out. And then my daughter, Carolyn, who's sitting over there now, went to school this day, come back and said, there's a guy over there cracking a whip. I said, well, let's go over and have a look. She said, you better go and have a look. When I seen him, I thought, what a miserable exhibition this is. <laughs> you know, this is all this guy can do. So, bingo, off to town she went, bought this whip home, and we started and we did our own cab race to kick it off. And it virtually built in and built in and built in. Oh. And then in the 80s, we cleared off to America with it. Well, look, let's have a look at some of the photos that we've sure. got because the photos tell a thousand words, as they say. Um, this is the family. That's, yeah, that is the family. That's uh, myself and uh, Michael. Carolyn on the left and Gabriel on the right. Mm -hmm. And obviously this was a dress-up uh, act. And here's another example of... This is this Michael. This is Michael. Now, were you in America by now? Doing this? Uh, no, we were here in Australia. It, I didn't know we had red Indians in this. <laughs> no, we brought the costumes back from America. Right. Uh -huh. But Fantastic uh, that was a sharp shooting. Of course, the photo there is a tribute to Roy Rogers. Yeah. Which we got a beautiful letter back from Roy Rogers. Did you? Yeah, we got a beautiful letter and sent all the tickets and stuff to go over before he passed away. This was. Wow. And well, we never got the opportunity to go back and, and see him and yeah. see the whole deal. But I know we would have been welcomed if we mm. went back. Wow. But that went over tremendously well. But in truth, you're you're a true Australian gentleman. Um, it, I think we've got some more shots here before we before we put them all away because this <laughs> terrifies me. The biggest show in town blasts off. <laughs> my my favourite piece of machinery, the human cannon. We built it ourselves. Did you? And uh, it was the only one ever to be built in Australia at that time. We had some guys supposed to come out and fly it from America. They bowed out when I wanted the second flyer and we were way up at Port Arthur at the time. Mm. And we got the message through. Carolyn was in America. She was doing all the liaison work. And when we found out that he wouldn't uh, send the second flyer, I don't know why, because we would have leased the machine at any rate. Mm. We would have known the workings of it. Mm. So why you wouldn't send it? But anyway, that was the story on that magic. But also, we've got a shot here with the horse. Yeah. This is... And, and the, there was a tradition of performing horses, particularly in America. Yep. Was it Hopalong Cassidy here in Australia? No, Hopalong Cassidy was He was the American. States. No, he who was the Australian with the horse? It used to do radio. Smokey Dawson. Smokey Dawson, yes. Yes. Well, Smokey had a different act altogether. Yes, but the thing is, we as a country had acts that came assumed from the land. You know, That's that right, did things, Yeah, that, that did things that local people in shows around Australia could relate to. Yeah. Is that where most of the work came from for you initially? Oh, I think the so, but shows? it's a traditional thing. I mean, uh, once I found out I had what I had, then we started working on the acts, and we had something like 40-odd routines that we could do. And the reason for that is because years ago there used to be whip cracking competitions and they used to have up to 30 odd routines. And I said, well, that's no good. We've got to go past this. Mm -hmm. We've got to have them at our disposal. So I don't think Carolyn's got the scars, but. <laughs> <laughs> Carol, well, because she we'll have was... a look after. <laughs> yeah. No, tell the story about the whip around the waist. Oh, we were in Western Australia and the log choppers came down. And I was pretty friendly with all the log choppers at that time and we were staying down at Cottesloe, and uh, he'd seen the act on stage at the Perth Royal. So uh, he said, I feel sorry for you, and I don't know what in the hell you're doing, he said. But that To your daughter? Yeah, to my daughter. That girl's marked. He said, and I think you should be ashamed of yourself. Oh. But we should explain because you, you'd it was a, whip it, her around her yeah, middle. I was going to get to that. Yeah. I stand, uh, she had just the bra on and yeah. that long flowing Skirt. pants. Yeah. And, uh, I used to crack the whips right in front of her face about that far away. Yeah. And then I'd lean them back and I'd go one around the neck. Yeah. And then one around the waist. Right. And this is what he's seen. So anyway, the guys were talking there one night and they had a bet on for £10. <laughs> and they said, would Gabriel come down and show? I said, look, I'm pretty sure Gabriel would come down. So I went and got him. I oh. said, this, and one of the log choppers said, there's no marks. He said, this guy knows what he's doing. And the other guy said, no, 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 that scar's there for life. <laughs> so I went up and said, Gab, would you come down? I said, nothing really going to happen. I'll just lift your top up and lifted the top up and there was not, not a mark, mark, not a mark there. 
and over the moon. That was Jim Alexander. <laughs> yeah, amazing. So Wonderful just story. a quick list of some of the things you do, or you used to do, and that's been handed down through your family. Well, it's, it's, it hasn't been handed down, I suppose. It's stuff that I created, a lot of it. Oh, sure. Yeah, and a lot of it that Michael has put out a lot of time in with the guns. Yep. He's the fastest drawer in the West. He was in, in Arizona. I forget the five-eighths of a second, I think it was. Right. In a time. Well, the Americans would love that. <laughs> yeah, well, he got tied up in Arizona with the fast draw with Wes Flowers, who was a fast draw, wanted to take him back to America. Uh, but he's one of, he was one of those sort of guys that if you give him something to do, he would perfect it. Mm. Like we had the boxing gloves on one night. And I said, well, you can wear the gloves. I said, no, I'll go barefisted. And he said, OK, and he landed me one right in the eye, you know. So... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <it's, laughs> Did you get him, though? Did you get no, him back? I, I wouldn't even <laughs> no, no. The lovely thing, though, <laughs> is that I can see within your family, it's this lovely feeling of family and the joy that you've all had performing together and working together over the years. Well, it's like today, you know, with the pig racing. It's 23 years and it's still one of the biggest We really do have a picture of the pigs, don't we? have, yeah. I couldn't believe that. I thought that was a joke the boys no, put too. in. No, Just that is actually them. Bacon bits. 23 years. <laughs> and that's a 50 metre track, and they will cover that 50 metres in five to six seconds. Do you train them? Yes, there's over a month where the work goes into it. But I suppose the thing I should have brought along for you to have a look at was the diving pigs. The diving pigs. The diving pigs. pigs. The diving pigs. I'm sorry I never brought the shot in. <laughs> oh, that's goodness me. We'll have to do something about that in the future. That's Cass' fault. Not mine. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure, sure, sure. I'll blame her. Just, just stay with us for a minute, Tom. We're just going to take a quick break and we'll be back to talk this, um, to this amazing man about him and his family. Welcome back. Yes. What an amazing fella. Absolutely fantastic. <laughs> what a lovely story. We've just been talking about these diving pigs and we've found a photo of the diving pigs. We'll, we'll find it and then we'll get is it, it OK? You. Is it OK for the pigs? Do they do it? Do they want to or they don't want to? Everything. How do you handle them? Oh, look, it's all from when you first bring them in on a month and they've all got their own separate pens. The whole big trailer, which was a big Pantech, is all air-conditioned. And by the time they finish training, all Michael does is pull gates and they know exactly where to go after they've raced. So you and they train them and in. they want to do it. They're happy to oh, do it. Oh, they love to do it. So you were saying a doctor, a vet, came and checked all yes, this out? yeah. I won't, won't mention her name. Uh, but she came down and had a look at it. This is many years, about two years after we started. Yeah. Oh, OK. So that's... Possibly because 20, people are very touchy. Years ago. Ago. People are very touchy about performing animals. We yes. eat them, but they're they're still touchy about the performing animals. Mm. And I understand that it's it's fine. We got a couple of other shots before we, before we have to finish this program. Take a quick look at this. Well, that's Michael once again with the ropes, and which Mater has just started working them now. Mm -hmm. And uh, that took a lot of time. When he and the fast draw is up on the left hand corner, as you can see. And then with a lot of those shots were in uh, Fort Worth, Texas. And this one here, this is the family again, this and that one. clearly is you. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, that's my frame. And look, right I've got to get you. I've got to ask you to put up your feet and show us your these boots. amazing oh. boots. <laughs> no more than I've just been talking about. Look at those. <laughs> I have got snakeskin boots. They come from America. They're anacondas. And I wear them everywhere. And I was just saying out in the foyer there, I've sat in many places. And everywhere I go, someone comments on the boots. boots. Out of day when they did a big segment on my boots. <laughs> They're and I brilliant. said, if I had to wore those snakeskin boots tonight, <laughs> it would have topped it up. But I didn't want to go to the whole... They're, they're fantastic. Tom, they we could sit and talk forever. Because you have... Yeah, rostry skin. Yeah. Just a brilliant, yeah, a brilliant, brilliant life story. <laughs> and congratulations to you and your family. Mm. And, and, and importantly, for being a true Australian and creating a history of Australian entertainment that many people don't really recognise today, sadly. Yep. Well, I'd like to do it again sometime. I really would, even though I haven't had the invitation. That doesn't matter. I'm telling you. I will. I'll ask you back. I'll ask <laughs> Thank you, you back. Thank you very much. But listen, we have to go. Yeah. Janice. Fantastic. What a lovely story. Uh, please take care. <laughs> See you next time on our time. And keep Bye yourself nice till then. Bye. <laughs>